2017 has seen really good competition to the CPU market, especially thanks to AMD's Ryzen CPU lineup. For instance, you could get their Ryzen 5 1600 CPU with the cooler included and an inexpensive B350 motherboard and overclock it to really good levels. This represented extremely good value for money to the point where Intel's seventh generation CPUs were no longer seen as a really decent option for people looking for good price performance. However, fast forwarding to October 2017, marks the release of Coffee Lake, Intel's 8th generation CPUs. Some say this was rushed to market as a forced response to Ryzen, and quite frankly I agree with stock levels being quite low, especially for the CPU I'm reviewing today, the 8700K. Though with that aside, let's take a look at the gaming benchmarks, productivity, and also throw in some streaming and temperature results for you guys too. Welcome back to Tech Yes City, this is Brian coming to you guys today with the 8700K review. Now you guys have been hitting me up on Twitter and comment sections and other threads requesting I get this review out and I would have got it out sooner but there was a big mix up in my supply. However, ASRock did come through with a motherboard and also an 8700K, both of which I'm using in today's review. So big thank you to ASRock. We got the gaming i7 Fatality motherboard on display, rock solid board, really good for overclocking. The VRM temperatures are good as well, which I'll show in an upcoming video. But with that aside, you guys probably wanna know how this thing performs, all BS aside. So let's take a look at those numbers. So as you guys just saw in those benchmarks, the i7-8700K is legit. This thing is really kicking it to the competition and it's even cannibalizing Intel's own CPU lineup. I honestly don't see the purpose of a 7800X or a 7820X anymore. Even a 7900X is going to be a really tough sell for Intel now because the Z370 chipset and of course the 8700K is going to be a lot cheaper than an X299 motherboard and a 7900X. The only reason I could really see someone going for that of course is that quad channel memory, the extra PCIe lanes and if they could utilize those extra cores and threads and if they did then they might want to consider the 1950X as well which has 16 cores and 32 threads. But what we've got here on display is a 6 core 12 threaded beast. Now people will say it's only two more cores, four more threads over the 7700K and that's exactly what it is. The thing is however, it's two more cores, four more threads on the ring bus architecture which is an extremely low latency architecture which is great for gaming and not only that, it does productivity extremely well now practically with a 50% boost for 30 more dollars. So it's really easy to see how the 8700K is extremely relevant in 2017. I like to think of it as the new 5820K. When that was first released, that was extremely good value for money. The only problem back in 2014 was that games didn't need 6 cores, 12 threads. Fast forward that to 2017, games can now utilize those extra cores and threads, and of course that balance with productivity 
makes this a serious contender not just for gamers but also for people who are doing productivity as a best in slot CPU. As we can see with that Adobe Audition benchmark, which is still a single threaded test, the 8700K was winning those benchmarks. Now there's other things that I do on my computer like Photoshop, what about boot times? Everything's gonna be faster when it comes to single threaded performance with the 8700K. That's something that the competition and even Intel's higher end lineup of CPUs can't currently match, which is why the 8700K really is a shining star despite all the negative attention it's getting and of course the dodgy things that Intel do as a company. But on that note of dodginess, Intel, I don't know how many times I have to say it, please stop using thermal paste to connect the die to the IHS. People in my comments section refuse to buy your product just because you're simply doing this. And I'm sure it would only cost you a little bit extra to implement this on your CPU. You could even charge this onto the customer for $364 instead of $360. And I'm sure people would be glad to pay the difference. I know I definitely would instead of having to run down, delid the thing, buy some liquid thermal paste and then drop it on there and hope and pray that it runs better. And also on that note, I've just voided my warranty. But with all that aside, we could see in the temperature test that the 8700K benefits a lot from a D-lid. I couldn't even get this thing stable at five gigahertz without D-lidding it. I mid it into the benchmark, it would crash and fail. And then after I D-lidded it, it was perfectly stable. However, on that note, there is a setting in the BIOS that you will want to enable. I found this helped a lot with stability. It was the offset with the ring to the core ratio. I had to set this to enabled and then I found stability at 1.33 volt on LLC level of one. But also on that note, the software is misreading the voltages, especially CPU ID in IDA 64. Other programs like hardware monitor are kind of getting it right, but even with that, they're showing weird numbers, especially when it came to the LLC scaling, that's the load line calibration. So hopefully some BIOS updates and some new software updates can fix this, as even though it's the 1151 socket, Intel have changed it around to allow more power delivery to these six core 12 threaded CPUs and also the six core six threaded CPUs like the 8600K. Though looking further into the gaming benchmarks, we could just see that this CPU was an absolute beast for gaming. If you're into competitive gaming, this thing is quite simply the best. Couple that with streaming, it's still the best. It's beating the 7900X to as a streaming CPU. Now, whether that changes into 2018, 2019 is still up for debate. However, on that note for now, it's a really snappy architecture. The ring bus is extremely good for competitive gaming. But on that note, GTA 5, when you look at a game like that, it did have some stuttering and this caused some weird numbers. And when I researched around, apparently this game is just getting that many frames on the 8700K that it's breaking the engine. So I did witness this when I was testing it in 4K where it was no longer stuttering because the frame rates were now lower due to the 4K demand on the graphics card. So that is a weird anomaly. However, GTA 5, it's not a competitive game, so I will exclude that. And even if it was a competitive game, I'm sure they would patch this problem because competitive gamers would have a field day with it if this was implemented in a game like CSGO or Dota 2, for example, or PUBG. Though moving on into PUBG, it was actually this CPU that made me realize that this game had a hard lock in the frame rates. Of course, PUBG did recently get a patch as well for better utilization of CPU cores. So it was probably this patch coupled with the 8700K that made me realize this. However, the 8700K is the best for PUBG players, both streamed and non-streamed benchmarks. Moving on into Dota 2, extremely smooth. We were getting near 240 FPS a lot of the times throughout playing this game and also even in heavy battles, it was really only dipping down to like 170, 180 FPS. So it was extremely capable, especially if you're a competitive Dota 2 player. Looking at CSGO, again, the best frame rates I've seen yet. I showed just how powerful this thing was with some plays in CSGO in my recent build video. So if you wanna check that out, I'll put a link in the description below. And also another game that really stood out was Far Cry Primal, of course. This game really is related to a CPU's latency, I find. The better the CPU's latency is with the latency controller and built into the CPU itself, the better frame rates you generally get, of course, coupled with IPC and other things like clock speeds, this can give you a result that can vary quite greatly from CPU to CPU. Though that last benchmark, of course, that I'm gonna pull up for you guys is F1 2016 4K. We can see here, practically no difference if you're playing at 4K. So it doesn't really matter what new age CPU you use for 4K gaming, any CPU will pretty much be fine as the graphics card is getting really stressed at 4K. This is with a GTX 1080 Ti. So if you guys are a casual gamers and you just care about getting a really good experience, then of course, something like a Ryzen 5 1600 B350 motherboard and stock cooler, is gonna be great value for money. And then you can go 
spend extra money on a graphics card. However, if you guys want the best frame rates possible and you want a CPU that will last you for a couple of years, then the 8700K is a serious contender for your money. Of course, you have to get a Z370 chipset, which is more expensive than a B350 motherboard. But on that note, you will have to get a better cooler as well, because at 150 watts, this thing does demand a decent cooler. I was using the H110i from Corsair. It does a great job. And as I stated before, I had to deal with this CPU, which you don't have to do on the Ryzen CPUs. So now it's time to conclude the video with saying out of the big three companies, Intel, Nvidia, and AMD, it seems like Intel does pull the most shadiest stuff out there. Though with that aside, this poor 8700K, he was brought into this world, he didn't have a say, and I'm just gonna review this CPU on its merits itself. And what you're getting if you can pick it up for 360 US dollars, which is a different topic altogether, on its retail price, 360 USD, it is one beast of a CPU. For me personally, it's the best in slot out there by far. It's a really fast CPU, it's extremely snappy. For doing my Adobe Premiere work suite, it's extremely fast. And not only that, the gaming numbers as well. For gaming, this thing is just extremely fast too. So it's one of those CPUs that's hitting really hard for its price. And a couple with the Z370 motherboards, you can pick them up for around about $120. That's the ASRock Pro 4. And that'll do a pretty good job of overclocking too. Of course, I did use the gaming i7, which does have better MOSFETs and a VRM on board as opposed to the Z370 Pro 4. But with that said, it won't give you that big of a difference difference as it's still only using 150 watts. It's 50 watts more than the 7700K and it's got 50% more cores and threads. So the power consumption is scaling quite similar to the 7700K. The one that note, it still does use more power than an 1800X. So it is technically less efficient at five gigahertz versus four gigahertz on an 1800X. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to give it a big thumbs up and let me know in the comments section below what you think about the i7 8700K. If it was in stock today, I mean, it seems to be sold out everywhere. Would you buy one? If not, why? If so, why? Love reading your comments and thoughts as always. And I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.